when you have a good shot, you know when you have it, and, and usually I'll walk away after I know that I've captured it. And you certainly, you know, some of the heavier stuff for the scenes where they're really just giving it 100%, you know, you would never want to ask them to do that, you know, outside of a take. But some actors will give it to you. You know, there are some actors that prefer to stay in character. And so if you have a good relationship with them and for some reason you can't get a specific shot during a take, they, they might give it to you afterwards, you know. Hello and welcome back to the Viewfinders Photography Podcast. Graham Dargy here. I'm a photographer based in Aberdeen in Scotland and I'll be your host for the next hour or so as we go behind the scenes of Hollywood with motion picture stills photographer Matt Kennedy, who's fresh off shooting the latest Spider-Man movie and the Obi-Wan Kenobi series for Disney. Matt gives such an interesting insight into the movie business from a photographer's perspective. So if you're into that kind of thing, then stick around and I will introduce Matt shortly. Well, how have you been? Wherever you are, I hope you and your family are safe and well. First off, I want to acknowledge the huge response to the previous episode with George Steinmetz. Whoa, it's been the most downloaded episode of the show by far. So thanks to everyone who checked out the episode. Thanks to George for being a phenomenal guest. And if you're new to the podcast via that episode, welcome. It's great to have you along. And I hope you find plenty of inspiration in future and previous episodes of the show. Well, it's the first episode I've published for a few weeks. What can I say? I had a busy spell with photography work, shooting loads of casting headshots for performers, corporate headshots here in Aberdeen and Edinburgh. And I had a really cool little job shooting some product photography for an industrial business here in Aberdeen. So they've got some shiny products, which I don't really understand what they did, um, which they wanted shot in a kind of low key, kind of black background kind of way. So I go to the premises, set up all my lighting, a background, get the camera hooked up to the laptop and off you go. So that was really good fun, but just loads of back end with that job, just with the retouching and it just takes forever, but great to be working. So no complaints about that at all. Also here in Aberdeen, spring has arrived. Uh, it's such a relief after the long dark winter that we get here. So I've been wasting no time. I've already been out on the roller skates a couple of times this week with my little girl. Well, no, she's just turned six, so not so little nowadays. And the attitude is getting bigger all the time as well. It's insane. Uh, I'm sure any parent can understand what I'm saying. So you get the picture between shooting, processing, admin, family life, something had to give and it was the podcast. But hey, no worries, I'm back for the next five weeks and I'll be rounding out this season of the show with fantastic guests like Monty Rakusen, one of my favorite commercial and industrial photographers, Julia Redl, a German landscape photographer, Stephanie Johnson, an ICM photographer from the States, a couple of more brilliant guests coming up as well. So I can't wait to share this new batch of episodes with you. If you've been loving the podcast, then share it with your photography friends. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts and you could even drop a glowing five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It makes a real difference. And if you want to connect with me, you can do that on Instagram at Viewfinders Podcast, where you can find updates about the show. See my skating progress if you're interested in watching videos of a middle-aged guy falling. And uh, yeah, find out about upcoming live events. Speaking of live events, you had to know that segue was coming. I want you to know about Viewfinders Live. Viewfinders Live is a series of live online events which I host featuring some of my favorite guests from the podcast. You can join me and an audience from around the world on Zoom where my guest gives a behind the scenes look at their photography. You can ask them anything in the live Q&A and you might even win in the exclusive prize draw. Hosting Viewfinders Live has become one of my favorite things to do. It's fun informative honestly it's a bit nerve-wracking from my point of view uh, but it allows you to get up close with some brilliant photographers in the company of other viewfinders listeners without even leaving your home the next event features icm seascape photographer shona perkins on thursday the 31st of march 2022 and i've got more events in the pipeline by supporting the event you'll not only take your photography to new heights but you'll also be making it possible for me to keep producing new episodes of the show. As a podcast listener, you can save 10% on your ticket using the code 
VF10. That's capital V, capital F10. So go to viewfinderslive.com, use the code VF10, and I'll see you at the next event. Okay, on with the show. This week, my guest is Matt Kennedy, a motion picture stills photographer from California. I've always wanted to have a motion picture still photographer on the show, and there's nobody better at this than Matt. Matt's worked on movies including Spider-Man, No Way Home, Black Panther, Fast and Furious 8, as well as the new Obi-Wan Kenobi series for Disney, Star Trek Picard, and many more movies that you've probably seen. Matt has been nominated for several International Cinematographers Guild Awards. In 2018, he was invited to join the prestigious Society of Motion Picture Still Photographers, and some of his photographs from Black Panther are displayed in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. We talk about how Matt first got into the movie business, how he became a unit stills photographer, what it was like working on the latest Spider-Man film, which went on to become one of the biggest of all time, and some of the experiences he's had along the way. I love movies, and I love any behind-the-scenes documentaries, so talking to Matt was so interesting to me, and I really enjoyed flying through all of this stuff with him. So I hope you enjoy this too. Here's my conversation with Matt Kennedy. Matt, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you today. And where are you based? I am based in Southern California. I live in a, a small town called Seal Beach, California, which is about it's about half an hour south of Los Angeles. So okay. we're closer to Long Beach, which probably more people know of than uh, Seal Beach. Okay, yeah, I've heard of Long Beach for sure. Um, so I read in your bio that you were uh, photographing skateboarding and surfing. So yes. is that the kind of thing you're into? That is the kind of thing I'm into. Um, certainly throughout my childhood, you know, grew up skateboarding, surfing, the whole Southern California lifestyle. Um, and photography was always kind of in the back, in the background. My mom was a hobby photographer, so she did a lot of landscapes and portraits and things like that. So, um, yeah. And so I think there reached a point when I realized I was never going to be a professional skateboarder. And uh, the next the next best thing was just, uh, you know, taking photos of all my friends. And that was kind of where my love of photography started. Okay. And so, uh, I don't skateboard too much today. I'm 50, but I still surf. I surf with my son. My son is a big skateboarder surfer, so we like to do that together. So I still do it uh, a little bit. That's awesome. And so yeah. did you... Did you cry, like grab your mom's camera and then go take shots of your friends or how did that go? Yeah, pretty much. You know, there was always a camera or two lying around. So, you know, if I could buy film, I would go get, you know, her camera and uh, use it whenever I can. And then it got to a point where, you know, she just gave me one and that was kind of my camera. So, <laughs> And so for your mom with landscape work, is it, I don't know, is that Yosemite and things like that around there? No, she were kind of wherever we were at. She, uh, I, my mom actually passed away when I was younger, but she, when, uh, when she passed away, she was in Alaska. So she lived in Alaska and she did a lot of pretty amazing, uh, landscape for dark, you know, up there, mountains and sunsets and everything really beautiful. It's kind of hard not to take a good picture in Alaska. It's so, you know, photogenic up there. And so did you learn anything from your mom at all photography wise, or was just, you were doing different things? I was just kind of on my own, you know, she basically showed me how to, you know, use the camera and basic, you know, exposure and shutter speeds and things like that, how to load the film in there, obviously, but mm -hmm. it was kind of just, uh, you know, boots on the ground, you know, learn as you go. And that was kind of the beauty with film, you know, you never knew what you were going to get. And, uh, you know, the, the times you thought you didn't get anything, you got a pretty cool photo. And then there were times you'd get a whole roll of just garbage. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. you know, I just kind of learned, you know, trial by error. Okay, so you got the camera, you're photographing your friends doing the surfing and skateboarding. I just wondered, so that was sort of teenage years kind of thing. How did you start to get really sort of serious about photography? When did that happen? Uh, you know, probably in my early 20s. Um, like I said, my mom passed away when I just turned 20. I was a, a bit lost, you know, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. young person wandering around, didn't really know which direction I wanted to go. And I'd say probably in my mid-20s, I met a second cousin 
who was a cameraman in Hollywood. And I, the first time I'd ever met him, I didn't even know he, he had married one of my mom's cousins. And he kind of took me under his wing and, and let me come to work with him one day. And that really kind of reignited my interest in uh, just cameras and anything photographic. Um, and so that's kind of where it, it was re-sparked at that moment. And that was also my okay. introduction into the, the movie business, yeah. And so did he take you along to a set or something, or how did that work? So so he did sitcoms, so, you know, a lot of a television. And, yeah, he invited me to set one day, and I watched them film an episode. And at the end of the day, I, I basically asked him that, you know, I, I didn't believe that they paid him to do that. It just looked like too much fun, you know, yeah. working with all the camera systems that they had and, and just the, the general vibe of just being on set. And that was kind of the turning point for me. He mm -hmm. never really got me a job, but he introduced me to uh, the camera department on a film set. And I was working a regular job at the time. And I just took it upon myself to, on my days off on weekends, I would go to uh, rental houses and I would learn how to load 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter motion picture film <clears throat> in every camera system that I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. and just learn about all the accessories and how the cameras worked. And then I just kind of started shopping around to try to get on a set. You know, I would get on low-budget sets or sets that didn't pay. And so I started work as uh, an assistant cameraman, and that was okay. where I began in the film industry. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to ask, do you remember the sitcom show that he took you uh, onto the set for that time? Yes, it was a david spade show called just shoot me <laughs> so and i <laughs> yeah and i think it was about a, a i think they worked in like a newsroom kind of scenario they were journalists that kind of thing so okay this is the guy he's got like blonde kind of longish hair yeah he's one kind of one of the adam sandler gang one of those guys you know right yeah. okay that must have just been phenomenal fun to be on set like that and so um, I like how you, you sort of threw yourself at the camera gear and, and go to the rental houses and so on. And so, okay, I have to ask, when you got that first camera assistant or assistant cameraman job, mm -hmm. what production was that on? The first um, real studio job that I got was I was loading film for a visual effects unit uh, for this Kevin Costner movie called Message in a Bottle. Mm-hmm. And our responsibility is we were just photographing uh, weather. You know, there's a, a, I guess in the movie, there's a big scene where he's on a sailboat in the ocean and a, a huge storm comes in. So obviously they didn't film in a storm. So our job was to film uh, different variations of rain against black or green screen and then smoke and wind and just all of these elements that they were going to comp together into the final film. So that was really my first studio job, I think, was loading these uh, VistaVision large format visual effects cameras. So mm -hmm. it was crazy. So loading film like that is that's I presume is quite a junior kind of role on the set, I'm, I'm assuming. And so do you is there is it a system that allows you to work your way up? It, it used to be. I mean, I guess it still is today, but that was kind of the way that it worked back then is you would you would start in the camera department as a loader and then you would become a second assistant and then a first assistant, which is a focus puller and then a camera operator and then a director of photography. Um, mm. Yeah. So loader, film loaders, it's, it's always was odd to me because it's the entry level position into that department, but you have a, a ton of responsibility because not mm -hmm. only are you loading the cameras, but you're unloading the cameras with all of the exposed film for that entire day. <laughs> yeah. So not only if you, if you mess something up, it's not just your job, but it's every other person on set that you put in work for that day is on that mm -hmm. emulsion, you know, and that you could mm -hmm. ru potentially ruin the whole day's work if you flashed it or you unloaded it wrong or something like that. So any of us who have loaded and unloaded film cameras, the like photography cameras know that is, that happens, you know, so that, that must sure. be the worst. And then I presu presume they'd have to reshoot um everything in that event um i saw it must have been on imdb were you, were you working on the star trek 2009 film i did that was 
the one with J, that J.J. Abrams did, yeah, the, the first one mm-hmm. that he directed. Uh, that was, yeah, that was probably my last big movie as a camera assistant before I switched mm-hmm. over to doing set photography. Okay, so that takes me to my next question, really. When and why did you make that step over to being the stills photographer? Well, so I think like so many people, I had zero idea that, I had no idea that that job even existed, that there was a mm-hmm. photographer on a film set until I started working on a film set. And just from the get-go, it just fascinated me that <clears throat> you have this one person who's part of the camera department, but he's they're kind of aut- automatous. You know, they walk around, they kind of do their own thing. Um, and, you know, but they're still part of the crew, but they're contributing something more creative and differently than what we were doing. Um and it just always interests me. So I always befriended the the unit photographer on every film that I was working on as an assistant. And I th- honestly, I think uh, that just got to a point in my career and my age, whatever it was, I was just kind of burnt out on being an assistant. Mm-hmm. That's a very technical job. I love the technical side of it, but I was really kind of craving to get back into the creative part of it. And... Uh, I think I just kind of made a decision that that's what I was going to do. There were other factors that led up to it. I I had thought about getting out of the movie industry altogether. Um, But then when I kind of sat down and regrouped, you know, I had all the connections. I had the the set experience. It it was just kind of a no brainer for me to continue in the movie industry, but in a capacity of that, you know, something that I really wanted to do. Let me ask you then, the role of a still photographer, a unit stills photographer, to me, mm-hmm. looking at your work, it seems like quite a varied role um, with some sort of documentary stuff. There's some studio uh, elements to it, studio photography. And I'd like to touch on both of those things. But, well, let me ask you to put it in your words. Maybe you can talk about what the role typically involves on a big movie, like sort of big movie you've just done, like the recent Spider-Man movie, what kind of expectation is on you as the photographer on that set? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, to just in a nutshell, describe what a unit photographer is. The best way I can describe it to people is it's, you're essentially a photojournalist, um, but you're covering the making of a movie as opposed to, you know, a a war or some sort of conflict or something like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Not comparable that way, but the photojournalist part is probably the best way to compare it. You know, you mm-hmm. you um, you cover every aspect of it, and on a film like that, there's so much to shoot always. So you're shooting on set all day long, every scene, every setup. Um, you're trying to get the production stills. You're shooting behind the scenes uh, images. Um, sometimes you'll be asked to shoot prop photos. Uh, you know, so if there's a school IDs or, you know, passport photos or crime scene photos, we'll shoot those on the side, anything, family photos. If you see some sort of image or photo on screen, it's usually the photographer that takes those as well. So anything for like, I mean, I've had to recreate magazine covers that you you see on set. Um, Mm -hmm. there's so much to do, you know, we'll document, um, building of the sets. You know, if, if we have access to that, if they're building a set next door, they kind of like to have, uh, you know, before and after pictures of how the set was built. You know, the production designers, set designers love to have that stuff for their portfolios as well. And and just the making of the film, you know, there's this, mm-hmm. you know, I'll go shoot plates of the sets. I'll shoot props. Um, you start getting into the, the movies like the Marvel films and the things for Lucasfilm. You know, you'll shoot weapons and all of these things that could be reference photos for action figures or toy boxes or, you know, lunch boxes. There's just so nowadays there's so many places the content is used. Mm -hmm. There's never, never really a shortage of things to photograph on set. Um, So, yeah, you're always pretty busy doing that. Okay, that sounds really interesting. I wasn't sure if you would be there all day like that for the whole thing. Or if they just bring you in at certain times for certain purposes, and maybe it depends <clears throat> if it's a if it's the big thing like you're saying, like they have to get reference photos for toys and whatnot. I can understand that, but um, okay. So would you have a specific brief per day, or are you just you know what the overall brief is and you kind of go at it? That's pretty much it. I mean, at at that level on those types of films, uh, they they hire you because they know that you're gonna 
you know, they're, you're going to get what they need. You're going to kind mm-hmm. of make sure everybody has what they need uh, across the board for all usage. Um, you will get notes from the studio from time to time that, you know, we need, we're, need this type of shot if you see it, or we may have a, a special character that only shows up, you know, for a couple of days. Let's make sure we cover them a little heavier than somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, you will get notes and there's a wish list sometimes. Um, so yeah, it's not like you just go in blind, but you know, that during pre-production, most of the time, except for like the top secret projects, you know, we get to read a script, you know, we'll get a shooting schedule. So we know what we're doing, you know, every day. Um, mm-hmm. So because we're part of the crew, we, we get all the, that updated information too. So you, you really know what's happening. And, you know, I like to read the script if I can, or at least the the pages for the day, because mm-hmm. you can kind of in your own mind, you know, get an idea of what might be a good visual you know, things like that. You make notes and you do some research. Not everybody does, but depending on what we're doing, I try to do some stuff like that. Like if you're doing a car movie, uh, I would maybe look at car magazines, automotive magazines, and see how Mm -hmm. those guys photograph cars and certain angles, you know, just just for reference, not necessarily Mm -hmm. to to copy or follow, but just kind of give you an idea if you're doing something that you haven't done before. So Okay, it just, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of taking it in really because I, the, I thought the idea that you're there the whole time, it's quite full on. You must end up with a lot of pictures. Um, so who would you be reporting to then? I don't know if this is a really nerdy question, but um, is it like a producer or you're sending it to the marketing department or who's your boss? Yeah, I don't, I guess the filmmakers in the studio would be considered my boss. It's, it's, it's really strange because the person that hires you could be different on every project. Sometimes it's the producers that ask for you. Sometimes it's the studio. It could be the director. It could be an actor that you've worked with before. They might request you. Um, Mm -hmm. So as far as, you know, reporting to somebody, there's always a unit publicist and they're kind of the liaison between myself and the studio and the filmmakers and they're also responsible for any kind of set visits or press visits. They also handle all the behind the scenes video that's being shot. You know, they're, they're kind of, they kind of oversee that. That would be probably the closest person that I would do any kind of reporting to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, every studio has photo editors. So usually a photo editor is assigned to the film as well. So that's kind of my go-to person at the studio. Um, but then, yeah, then you'll get requests or you'll have to deal with the publicity and marketing departments at the studios. You know, they may have requests. If, if we end up doing a poster shoot for the film, that's something that's separate from the unit photography. So that would be more like a studio environment on a separate day, separate budget that that's usually when I would deal with the marketing publicity team. And then they would have, uh, you know, art directors or, you know, an ad agency that they're working with. So there's a lot of other people involved in that end of it. Um, but on the day to day, it's usually, I'm just kind of on my own. I, I turn in my coverage to the laboratory. We have a, a lab still, we still have a digital still labs. So mm-hmm. usually the content I'll, I'll put everything on a hard drive every week. I'll kind of do a, I'll turn in a, a hard drive every week of the images for the week. They will upload that to their server and nowadays it's all kind of digital online proof sheets um, that talent and filmmakers can look at, you know, t- images to approve and kill. The studios have image uh, access to the lab as well. Um, and that's kind of where everybody pulls from. So I shoot it, I give it to the lab, the lab, you know, gives access to everybody else. So, mm-hmm. and that's kind of how they see what I'm doing. So. This is so fascinating to me. I come from Aberdeen in Scotland. It's like the farthest place from the movie industry. So I'm, <laughs> this is all really, I'm learning so much here. Um, and I was wondering, when you're photographing and they're, they're shooting a scene, they're actually shooting a scene right then, I, I'm thinking if it was me, I would be wanting to stay back, stay out of the way, and I'd be worried about... Um, if if what I'm doing was interfering with the sound recording, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. On the movie, mm-hmm. is is there any problems with that or any issues when they're actually shooting a scene? Are you allowed to photograph that or how does that go? No, we're a hundred percent allowed to photograph the scene unless it's an issue with an actor. 
And you will okay. run into an actor once in a while that will kind of throw out, you know, you're distracting, whatever. You really just kind of have to read the room and, and mm-hmm. build a relationship with every actor. For the most part, they're all pretty good. They know it's part of the job. Um, as far as the sound, we used to shoot, when everybody was using DSLRs, we would shoot in these things called sound blimps. So they're, they're housings that suppress the noise. You could still hear it a little bit. You know, the microphones are pretty sensitive on a film set, the gear that they're using. Um, but with mirrorless nowadays, there's zero, zero sound. So Mm -hmm. you can, you know, shoot away all you want during a take. And Mm -hmm. that's my preference. And most of my, you know, fellow unit photographers that I'm friends with, you, you get the best stuff during the scenes, during the takes. That's mm-hmm. when, you know, the full emotion or the action is there, you know, that captures the best images. Um, but yeah. sometimes during, in between the takes too, when they're resting or they're kind of in another space, sometimes those are some great images as well. You just really have to be uh, alert and pay attention, you know, all day long because you never know when those, those great images are going to come. Yeah. So you really just have to pay attention. There's um, just on on what you said there about capturing the best sort of moments from the actors. One of the pictures that really jumped out at me was there's some shots of I think it's Janelle Monae um, mm-hmm. for Ante, Antebellum. Um, yeah, and she she's her emotion that she's portraying there is, seems so raw. I haven't seen the movie, but um, it yeah. seems really really intense. And so um, I guess that's the kind of ideal that, that you can pick that up because maybe the actors they can i don't know if they can just keep doing that again and again to bring that emotion out yeah i mean you certainly and janelle was great by the way and just fantastic to be around and she's just very very great with everybody very gracious and letting everybody do what they needed to do and uh you know when you have a good shot you know when you have it and and usually i'll walk away after i know that i've captured it Mm -hmm. and you certainly you know some of the heavier stuff for the scenes where they're really just giving it a hundred percent, you know, you would never want to ask them to do that, you know, outside of a take, but Mm -hmm. some actors will give it to you. You know, there are some actors that prefer to stay in character. And so if you have a good relationship with them and for some reason you can't get a specific shot during a take, they they might give it to you afterwards. You know, they Mm -hmm. might do a little setup with you, but they're all different and every project is different. Every scenario is different. So you Mm -hmm. just really kind of have to, you know, play it by ear. Let me move on to asking you, you touched on it earlier, but about the studio shooting. So if you have to do, Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask if you do that as things are going or if it's a separate day, if you have to shoot for the movie posters, because that's, it's a different kind of thing than uh, photojournalism, like you described for the other uh, on set work. So I guess... I don't know, is there like a day when everybody comes in or can you give talk through the sort of studio element of that? That varies on every project too. And we don't always get to do them as unit photographers. Um, okay. Sometimes the studios will bring in the, you know, these heavy hitting advertising guys that will, you know, they'll get their own team and it'll just be kind of their own thing going on while we're shooting the movie. Um, but then when we do get to get asked to do them, sometimes we'll do them on a production day while we're filming because, you know, the cast members that they want in the poster might only be working that day, you know. So they'll mm-hmm. go on set and do their scene and then they'll come to me, you know, in a studio set up somewhere close by and we'll knock out their coverage for the poster. Um, but, yeah, when I when I get asked to do them, it's usually, you know, a sound stage or somewhere close to where production is shooting. It could be on the same day. It could be on a weekend. It really kind of just depends on, you know, actor availability, who's around, who do they want in the poster. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah. It's just, it's different on every job. I mean, I did, I did it for Spider-Man and I believe we did that on a day off. It was a production day off, but we had the entire cast in town Right. So, you know, we did a we did a pre light day and then we got them we got everybody to come in on a shoot day and then we just kinda knocked it out and shot everybody. Because with that well, probably any movie I guess, they have to be in the costume, but the costume is really relevant, I suppose, in, in a movie like Spider Man. Yeah, so yeah, it it there's so many factors, yeah, depending on uh what costume they want them in. They could have multiple costumes, you know, for a project. 
we may shoot them in every costume that they have because they don't know what will end up in the poster. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of elements, but everybody has to be there. You know, if they're, if they carry weapons or props, you know, the prop team has to be there, hair and makeup, costumes, you know, everybody. Um, mm-hmm. I've done poster shoots where we've had special effects technicians and stunt people because we've had to hang people from a wire for a shoot or something like mm-hmm. that. You know, there's just, it really just depends on, on what you're doing. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a, it would be a pretty fun, but intense kind of day's work to, to knock through all of that. Uh, you need a lot of variations for each character, presumably. And with that Spider-Man movie, a lot of different characters too. Um, and then with yeah. all everybody buzzing around, you know, the rest of the crew buzzing around, kind of the pressure's on that day. Do you, you enjoy that? Do you oh, thrive under that? Or? No. no, it's <laughs> super stressful. <laughs> yeah, I'll be I'll be a hundred percent honest. I am my most comfortable on set, you know, where I can kind of just, you know, do my thing. Um, I, I think over the years I've gotten more accustomed to doing the poster shoots. Uh, the Spider Man one certainly was a lot of fun, just because the cast was fantastic. But um, yeah, it's a it's a lot of stress, you know, because they uh you know they want every you know they want you to bring it you know that mm-hmm. prior to the shoot they'll send you um lookbooks of uh concepts you know sometimes they'll have concepts that you know they're basically just uh you know sketches or or drawings that the ad agency has done on what they would like the posters to look like so then you have to recreate all these poses with the actors and then mm-hmm. they'll send you a lookbook of lighting references from all these other films maybe or or maybe not even a film and this is how they want you to light it so then you have to figure out how to do that and then mm-hmm. i remember on a movie there were 13 different setups that i had to do with the lead actor and they mm-hmm. you know we had five different sets built and five different lighting setups and we had to march everybody through. And it, it's a full day's work, definitely. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people watching, you know. And I think Spider-Man was a, a – it was a lot of fun, but it was a, a – I felt like there was a lot more writing on it because it was the third film. I don't know. Have you seen it or – I haven't seen it, but I, I know it's okay. The well, I won't movie. tell you who. <laughs> I won't spoil it. But yeah. so there were a lot of characters that showed up for the poster shoot that hadn't been mm-hmm. seen in a while, and so that we, you know, I had to shoot all these guys too. And it was the first time that anybody'd seen them all together. And I was actually getting to photograph them for the poster before they actually worked on set for the film. Okay. And it was yeah. just a lot of a lot of things going on, but it it was still fun and pretty pretty happy. It seemed like everybody was pretty happy with the the results. So. Yeah. So do you, do you, in that event, sorry to get geeky, but are you shooting in, tethered into a computer? Maybe is there somebody on hand to say, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. no, absolutely. Yeah. Usually I'll have at least, you know, two assistants that help, you know, move strobes around and, and grip gear and things like that. Um, but also we'll have a Digitech. Yeah. So we're, we're tethered in and they'll have multiple monitors going because, um, you know, like I said, on, on that particular job, you know, we had, really high to do people from the marketing team at Sony and Marvel there, you know, with Marvel security, we had, you know, the producers and the director of the film, you know, and then obviously all the talent is kind of watching as we're shooting too. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. That sounds like a full crew. Yeah. But I can, I just imagine while you're shooting away, what kind of business is going on behind you with talent and executives and who knows what that would just going to be a lot of energy in that room. I'm glad to hear that you get stressed about it because sometimes <laughs> I feel like I must be the only photographer who gets stressed because yeah. everybody else makes it look easy. Okay. Um, let me ask you about a couple of projects in particular. Um, and maybe you can mm-hmm. just give me your, any sort of takeaways from it. I, I I was keen to ask you about Star Trek 2009, and we've done that, but I, I noticed as well that you'd worked on Star Trek Picard, which I was a big fan of. Um, mm-hmm. And so any sort of memories from that? Was that a good experience to be part of? It it was, and I, I didn't do the whole thing. So um, I did the pilot for the show, so the, the mm-hmm. first episode that aired. Um, and funny enough, the sound mixer was the same who's a friend of mine is a gentleman by the name of peter devlin he was the sound mixer on the star trek movies as well and you know Mm -hmm. we were kind of just talking and he said oh you know the producers from the movie are doing this pilot called picard you know you should try to do it 
and I just kind of reached out to the the studio that was doing it, and they're like, oh yeah, we, we didn't think you were available. We'd love to have you do it. So I shot the pilot, and it was great. Um, you know, Patrick Stewart's wonderful, just mm-hmm. a legend. Um, but yeah, so that part it was it was fun. I was interested to ask about Black Panther I, and mentioned the connection that I have to the photography there. Sure. But that it was obviously it's a great movie, but it seemed like a, a big deal, you know, at the time. Was there yeah. a sense or do you get a sense of that? I was wondering with Spider-Man as well. I, I guess there was, this is the biggest movie Spider-Man at the moment in the world. There, there must be a sense around a production like that when they kind of know it's going to be something special. Is, do you find an extra buzz around those big, big productions? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, Black Panther for sure. It just felt so different than any other Marvel movie. Um, we kind of all knew that this was going to be, I guess you could say it was going to be special, you know, but I don't think anybody realized how much of an impact it was going to have on everyone though. Mm-hmm. I think um, it just kind of hit at the right time politically and socially you know that's what people needed that's what people wanted to see and you know it was a fun movie so um yeah we definitely had a sense while we were doing that and then i think on spider-man 2 i mean it's uh you know the first two were really successful you know they're definitely fan favorites uh big following you know everybody loves tom tom's a great great guy and Mm -hmm. uh yeah, I think, you know, just because of who was in it and what we were filming, I think everybody knew it was going to be pretty good. But I, once again, I don't think everybody knew how hard it was going to hit. I mean, it's it's mm-hmm. still kind of just crushing everything right now. So, um, you know, they're going to be popular and successful. I just don't think you always know at what level. The other one I have to ask about, I have a five-year-old daughter and she's she's such a big fan of Will Smith. And I was just putting her to bed before I came on the call. And uh, I was saying, well, daddy's calling this guy who works in movies. And she's like, does he, does he know Will Smith? And I was like, yeah, I think he does know Will Smith. <laughs> so I had to ask you uh, on behalf of my daughter how it was to work with Will Smith. Will was great. He's such a, just a nice man. Just really great with the crew and just everyone just genuinely a nice guy i I honestly wish i could work with him more and you know who's to say i won't i don't think he's going anywhere so if the opportunity ever came up i would definitely jump at it he was he was great and that was a really hard movie that we did um i think it was just hard on everybody the crew the cast um so yeah but yeah will's will's wonderful yeah okay um it's aladdin that she knows him from and so you know oh yeah. okay yeah so we've seen that and heard that a, a lot of in our house <laughs> let's change uh talk slightly and i'm gonna ask you about your uh gear when you're uh, on set photojournalism style what do you reach for what's your sort of go-to camera and lens combination so I have always been a Canon shooter. So currently I'm using the Canon's R5s and R6s mm-hmm. with RF lenses. Uh, and my go-to lens is I always have two bodies on me. It, the kind of the just the workhorses for unit photography is the 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200. It kind of mm-hmm. covers everything that we need uh, that you have access to. Um, I do have some primes. I do have some, uh, you know, a, wider zoom 16 to 35 you know some longer zooms as well but those are kind of the two just staple lenses that you know you use 90 percent of the time just the sort of classic combination that everybody has isn't it the 24 to 70 and 70 to 200 but you you kind of do everything with that yeah and you know the zooms are you know they're fast and just the cameras themselves you don't i don't feel like i really need primes for much i'll pull out primes if i'm doing portraits or something interesting like that but shooting on set it's always the zooms are it's just the way to go because if you have to adjust you know on the fly because something comes into your shot or you're not tight enough or you're not wide enough then you can just you know take it on the barrel a couple millimeters here or there mm-hmm. it's just really the most practical thing to shoot with on set mm-hmm and so your camera in hand all of the time i guess for that kind of thing and then for processing and software you pass that on then to somebody else in house in the studio yeah so i'm just kind of old school where you 
try to get it right the first time around in camera, you know, try mm-hmm. to make sure that your exposure and everything is, is, you know, as good as you can get it. And then, uh, I will do a quick pass just in Photoshop raw, you know, I'll just go through my raw reader and look at images on a, on a computer screen. Mm-hmm. And if there's something that I don't want to turn in that, you know, maybe the focus isn't where I wanted it or it's out of focus or I just don't feel the image, you know, then I will throw those away and then they won't make the final pass, you know, and then everything is shot raw. So after I do my quick pass from each day, yeah, everything goes to the, to the lab to process. And if there's uh and at that point, it's pretty much out of my control what they do with the images. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's some way they want them to look for their marketing needs or maybe they have a concept, you know, with different like desaturation or, or colors or something like that, then, you know, they'll they'll change it. But to try to get the first time around as close to what we're shooting on set, you know, to match uh, and just make sure they're good, sharp, clean images. Let me ask if you have any piece of camera kit in your bag that you bought, you thought it was a good idea, but it's never seen the light of day. You never, ever used it. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me think about that. <laughs> I used to, uh, not so much anymore. I think over COVID, I really kind of cleaned house and got rid of a lot of gear that I wasn't using. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I guess... I mean, I used to have a 600 millimeter that I used every once in a while, but that was just a really expensive lens, and uh, mm-hmm. I got rid of that. Maybe filters. I feel like you know I have polarizers and things like that that are in my kit that I won't get rid of because as soon as I get rid of them, I, I might need them for something. But maybe yeah. that. Right? But other than that, it's my kit's pretty streamlined. I don't. I don't want to have a lot of extra stuff. You kind of. You know, you know what you're going to use, and I just kind of keep it to that. And if there's something special that I need, then, you know, you just go rent it. But mm-hmm. for the most part, it's it's pretty streamlined, I think. Uh, okay, let's move on to a round called Double Exposure, okay? And this is where I'm going to ask you about a particular photograph, which I, I'm really interested to know the story about. And then I'll throw it back to you to tell me about one of your favorite pictures or some picture that has a great story behind it. So there's a couple that I really was interested to ask you about, actually. And you kind of mentioned it earlier. There's the Time magazine shot of George W. Bush, but it's, um, (laughs) oh, what's the actor again? Uh, Sam Rockwell? Oh, Sam Rockwell. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw that you'd had to recreate this Time magazine cover. And then one of my guests recently was Gregory Heisler and he's one of my favorite photographers and I I was like isn't that a Gregory Heisler shot and I couldn't find it but I'm pretty sure looking at the style of it I'm pretty sure it was and I just thought it was kind of a weird connection of dots to talk to you who's had to recreate one of his pictures when I just spoke to him sure not 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 long ago but I was interested in that shot and also another shot from that movie I think the movie is Vice um Mm-hmm. where I think it's one of the female actors is photographed in a really old fashioned kind of style. And I was sure I wanted to ask about the Heisler shot, if it is Heisler. Um, it, ho- hopefully it is. If it's not, somebody else might be uh, unhappy for us ah. saying that, but I kind of feel like it was. And um, also having to shoot that old, old fashioned looking picture of the other actor which looked like it might have been a fun shoot to be part of. Can you talk about any of that stuff for me? Yeah, so the George W. Bush, the Time magazine, um, that's one of those things that I was talking about before where there's a scene where I, I believe Christian Bale, who plays Dick Cheney, is is in Bush's waiting room to see him, and there's the issue of Time magazine on the coffee table. And they wanted, you know, obviously – Sam Rockwell's version of Bush on that cover, you know, and it's something that I don't, I don't even remember if you even see it in the film, but it's just kind of one of those little minute details, Mm -hmm. you know, the director wanted it there. So, um, yeah, so we did it. So obviously I don't know what kind of setup that they did when they originally shot that. So we just kind of studied it. And, um, I think what ended up happening is we were shooting, well, we actually had to shoot it three times. Um, Uh And I, I, if I recall, it's because the director, they weren't happy with 
Sam was wearing a prosthetic nose to look like mm-hmm. George W's nose. Okay. And I think they hadn't had it dialed in to exactly where they wanted it. So the first two okay. attempts at the magazine, they just weren't really happy with the nose. So when they finally got his makeup dialed in, you know, he did a scene and then we were, I think we were in an old building in downtown LA and there, we were on like the sixth floor of this building and there was just really nice sunlight coming through the window. And I just sat a stool by the window and I put up a black floppy four by floppy for some negative fill. And we just Mm -hmm. sat him in there with I think it was an 85 millimeter and fired off a couple and it, that's what ended up on the magazine cover. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. Uh, it was great. Yeah. Sam is wonderful. And you know, it's always, it's a little, it's fun, but it's a little nerve wracking too, because you're trying to create, you know, recreate someone else's work and it's never going to be exactly like theirs, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe not even as good as theirs. Um, but it's still kind of fun. And that, that movie vice was so much fun and it was very heavy, uh, photographically, um, so many photos to shoot that were real life existing photos. I had to shoot portraits of every member of the White House staff <clears throat> for multiple time periods that Cheney was in the White House. Um, so every actor that had a, a role as a politician or someone whose photo was in the White House, we had I had to shoot portraits of all of them, and they were lining the hallways of our sets, and you know from newspapers and just magazine covers, just so much stuff. I had to recreate. Cheney family photos that were existing. I mean, wedding photos when they got married. So it was it was very heavy still wise. That just sounds like a lot of fun. Um, you have to yeah, you know, it, it create was. all of the photographs that you see and say, and it's in a house in the movie. Everything in there. It just sounds like super duper fun. Yeah, and that's kind of the same uh, with the the photo of our young actress um, that you're talking about. Haley, I, oh my, I'm totally blanking on her last name, but she was wonderful, and she played uh, Lynn Cheney as a teenager. So I believe that photo was for a yearbook, a yearbook mm-hmm. photo, and mm-hmm. we shot it a couple different ways. I shot it digitally, um, but everything was we used hard light. We used like Fresnels and just really hard, you know, focused lighting for that. And mm-hmm. I shot them digitally, and then I also shot all of them on an old Rolleiflex. Uh, medium format so and that was a lot of fun too and that was kind of you know going into the movie I actually had to interview with the director and the cinematographer and they were going to shoot a lot of different formats on that film and they wanted me to shoot film as well as digital so you know that was kind of fun that was the only time I've been asked to shoot film which was fun but at the end of the day I think they ended up using digital versions and just made them look like old film images so you know yeah that would be easier for their for them i guess but it it, yeah. it can tell that you used the right uh, gear for the lighting it just looks so authentic um to the time period um okay let me throw it back to you anything that really yeah. stands out as a, a great memory or a great anecdote from your experience on, on movie sets oh boy there's so many so many great memories <laughs> and so many get just lost. I don't know. Vice was a wonderful experience. Like I said, I had a lot of fun on that. The cast was fantastic. It's, you know, just all heavy hitters. Uh, Christian Bale is certainly top five favorite actors to work with. He's just mm-hmm. a, just a joy and, and just really uh, giving as far as what I needed to do with him photography wise. Um, and I think one of my favorite images from that, film it may be on my instagram uh it's a behind the scenes image of him as a younger cheney and it just shows like multiple hands kind of coming into frame to fix his makeup or his costume or his hair Mm -hmm. and i don't know i just really like that image it just kind of stands out as you know it really does kind of take a village to make a movie and just to show how many hands are on an actor at a time you know adjusting things it just it just seemed like a really fun photo to me i'll put a link to that picture in the show notes and the other ones that we spoke about it seems to me you know from seeing behind the scenes footage and you know knowing what i know about the business that you're in like there seems like a real sense of excellence about everything that goes on around movie and tv production 
and like everything's been done to a really, really high standard with the best people, best equipment and so on. Have you found that and how does that rub off on you as a professional in terms of bringing your best to work every day? Yeah, I mean, I will say that I wish that was the case on every project. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, and especially the jobs at the higher level, like the Marvel projects and, you know, those types of things. It, you just want to do your best. I mean, everybody is that is there is the best at what they do, the top of their game. And I think just being surrounded by people that are really good at what they do just rubs off on you un in an unintentionally, you know, it's just, you're surrounded by it. So yeah, I think you just really, you want to do really good and excel at your, your job as well. You know, you, you just, it's such a collaborative effort. And when you see all these other people really just bringing it, I think it just brings out the best in everybody. And you know, mm. hopefully it shows in the in the final product. Yeah, I think it does. Um, okay, last round. Okay, this is a quick fire round called Motor Drive, and um, so I've just got a few quick questions. Okay, you ready? I think so. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's bring it home. It's wide angle or telephoto. Uh, wide angle. Okay, tea or coffee? Ooh, coffee. Okay, I always expect coffee from stateside. Um, but I do okay. like tea, though, so it's a tough one. <laughs> you do? Okay, have you got a, I do, a special, yeah. special brand of tea that you prefer? No, just English breakfast tea, I guess. I don't know. Any... Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Okay, um, expensive lens cloth or just the corner of your shirt? Uh, corner of the shirt is most readily available. Yeah, that's for sure. The lens cloth, who knows where it is. Um, okay, what's your favorite or go-to emoji? Oh, uh, middle finger? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, and uh, what's your favorite movie? Oh, boy, that's so tough. Um, I'm just going to take it back to my childhood and uh, Star Wars. A New Hope is probably definitely, or Raiders of the Lost Ark. Definitely oh, top. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay. What's a weird thing I can find in or around your camera kit? Oh, a weird thing around my camera kit. The most out of place. Well, it's not even out of place. I'd say hand sanitizer lately, but. Okay. I find everyone seems to pick up some quirky gadget or something that they use. Um, but that's okay. Mm. Sanitizer is essential. And like you said, <laughs> yeah. not weird nowadays. So. Uh, probably yeah. a few face masks in there, I guess. Um, yeah, definitely some face masks in there. Name a photographer we should all know, whether from your side of the industry or just an overall photography hero. Uh, well, definitely in my industry, I would say uh, I have two that are my real favorites, uh, Justin Lubin and Scott Garfield. They are probably okay. two, of my, two of my favorites. Okay, I'll definitely look those up and I'll put a link in the show notes so people can check that out too. And Great. last one, when do you feel at peace with the universe? Ah, probably when I'm in the ocean. It's very therapeutic. Yeah, I don't think you want to be in the sea that's near our house in the North Sea. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess the California Ocean is a much nicer place to be. Uh, um, it's probably definitely not as cold. Matt, I'm so grateful for your time today. I've, I've learned so much. It's really exciting for me to get an insight into this, into the movie business through the eyes of a photographer. Um, I'm super, super grateful. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Follow Matt on Instagram and check out his website to see some of his amazing body of work from documentary stuff to the movie posters we spoke about. Just phenomenal work. Remember, you can use the code VF10 to save money on your ticket for the next few Finders Live event. And if you like this episode, then check out my conversations with Gregory Heisler and Tim Clayton. That's it. Take care. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.